Okay. Yeah. 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 I yeah. So, okay, well, let's get to start. Today's lecture is about protein separation and characterization. So, First question, what do you think about? Separation of proteins is based on differences in solubility, absorptivity, denaturation. So basically, if you want to separate proteins from other compounds, from other compounds, which of these features or properties help us to separate proteins? Solubility? Absorptivity, the language. I said it's all there. Okay. Any other answer? Agree? All of you agree? Okay. Agreed. <laughs> it's correct. Yeah. Later in this lecture, you can see all of them can help us to separate proteins from other components or even proteins from each other. Following up question. The following techniques can be used to separate proteins in solution. Size exclusion. Size exclusion is a method, a technology that helps us to separate molecules compound based on their size or molecular. Salting out, you know salting in, you know salting out based on your food chemistry. And electrophoresis. Again, this is based on molecular weight and molecular weights and charge. So, what do you think? We'll say all of the above again. All of the above. Any other answer? No more agreement? Yes, all of the above. So, why protein separation can help us, which is the use of protein separation? You studied about lipids, carbohydrates, different compounds. You can help. Yeah. Okay. Functionality, if you want to determine the functionality of the protein. Okay, what else? Help your friend other than functionality. <laughs> yeah. Uh, possibly like determining the amount of protein that you can actually use. For like, uh, yes, we can say protein content, protein purity. Yes, correct. So, sometimes you want to produce protein ingredients, like protein concentrate, protein isolate. Then we need to separate protein from other compounds, components, other ingredients. So that is one application of an importance of protein separation. And sometimes we need to identify a protein or characterize it in terms of its structural properties, functional properties, then we need to purify, to separate that protein from carbohydrates, from lipids, we do lipid separation, we do lipid analysis, we want to do protein analysis. We want to determine the amount of protein, its characteristics, its uh, thermal stability, its denaturation state, uh, its functionality, then we need to purify the protein. We need to extract the protein and separate it from other components. And sometimes, 
we want to use a protein ingredient in our food product, but we need to know, okay, if I add this ingredient to my product, how can it affect that product? How can my processing method, like I'm going to hit that sample, that product, how affect uh, the protein? Uh, it's a structure, it's a stability, it's functional properties. So we need to separate the protein and do some trials on that. And before we add it to the final product and to other components, know, okay, if I hit this protein, if I mix it, if I apply some shear, if I change the pH or change the ionic strength, it's going to affect the structural properties of the protein in this way. And in such a way, okay, that is going to be used in this product. That is good for that type of product or not. So proteins. You know, the backbone of proteins are amino acids. So depending on the type of amino acid, the sequence of amino acid, proteins are different. Depending on the structures of proteins, they are different. So proteins are different in, you know, in different terms. Uh, one of them is nutritional quality. So when we have a protein concentrate, its nutritional quality differs from protein isolate. So you use those nutrition beverages. Some of them have whey protein isolate. If you add whey protein concentrate or hydrolyze it, the nutritional quality is different. Proteins are different in their functionality, like different proteins. Whey protein or casein have good foaming properties. Whey protein, again, back to that nutrition of beverages. Uh, you know, whey proteins are good. When you do workout, you can have those powders and you can easily solubilize them in water. But if you have casein, no. You need to heat the sample, give it time, work on that, steer it to get it solubilized. So proteins, deeper in their functionalities. Some proteins like casein, like whey protein isolate, have good foaming properties. Some others, no. So their functionality, by functionality, we mean those properties that help us to prepare food product. Solubility, foaming. Why do we need foaming in topic? In, um, Ice cream that overrun, you, you call it, uh, in another words, you can say foam. In uh, some uh, bakery products, you need emulsification. In yogurt, you need gelation. So these are called functional properties of proteins. Solubility, foaming, emulsification, gelation, sterilization. So proteins differ in their functionalities and also in their biochemical characteristics, like their molecular weight, their isoelectric point, whatever that helps us to characterize and identify a protein. Biochemical differences among, among proteins. So again, Proteins have different molecular weight. They have different shapes. Some of them are globular. Some of them are fibrous. Uh, so they have different size. They have different shape. They have different molecular weight. They have different charge. They have different thermal stability. Why their thermal stability is different? Because they have different structures. They have different amino acid. The sequence of amino acid is the secondary, tertiary, and quaternary structures are different. So they have different thermal stability based on their amino acid composition, based on their structures. Their thermal stability is different. So to separate proteins, we can use 
different properties and different mechanisms. Some of these uh, methods are based on solubility of elements. So we can use proteins characteristics for their separation. You know, salting in and salting out, when you add a salt like NaCl, when you solubilize the salt in water, it ionizes Na positive and Cl negative. So when the salt concentration is low, it's going to kind of charge the protein. It's if it's charged to protein because it goes around the protein molecules. And then it caught, it increases the charge of the protein and helps its solubility. But if you add high concentration of salt, again, it easily ionized in water. And then it, here we have two phenomena. First, it shields the charge of the protein. And then, you know, so if consider this is an ion and this is the protein bar. You see, this is really, really small, way smaller than this. And the protein is really, really bigger than, it's a macromolecule. So it's really, really bigger than an ion. So imagine you have small uh, particles, which are salt and very large particles. The charge or surface to volume ratio for ions is more than surface to volume for protein. So ions can act as stronger competitors and they can interact with water better. They can absorb water and make it inaccessible for uh, protein. So in this competition, when you have high salt concentration and you have protein, salts are the winner. They can interact with water better. Why? Because the surface to volume ratio for ions is way more. So water goes around those ions of salt and it's, and then protein molecules get close to each other and interact with each other via hydrophobic interaction, hydrophobic bonds. And so that causes aggregation and precipitation. One common salt that is used for salting out effect and protein precipitation and protein separation is um, ammonia sulfate. sulfate. Usually, the concentration that we use is like two molar, I believe. So salting out happens and protein persists. So we can separate the protein. Here is a question for you. Imagine you have five different proteins with different solubility at different you know, salt concentration. A is the least soluble in salt. And A, E, is the most soluble. If you want to separate this protein, C, what would you do? So A is soluble in low salt concentration. E is soluble in high salt concentration. From A to E, the solubility of protein in salt concentration increases. What would you do if you want to separate? Yeah. It's a stupid answer. But, yeah, um, it's not. <laughs> you, you can take your solid and then put it in uh, a solution of high concentration. Okay. And then take like whatever it doesn't solve, but then. Mm -hmm. So in this way, you are going to precipitate. Okay, let's say that high salt concentration just dissolves this, 
the rest are precipitated, then what? This is the first step. Th then what would you do to separate C? Well, I say you want to separate C, which is in the middle. Yeah, I would, I would say get one that can do both B and E. Then what about A and B? Well, you said that uh, A and B are soluble in like low. Okay. Yeah. So, so in the first step, you can get rid of rid of D and E. Yeah. And you have A, B, C together. Yeah. You want to separate this. Yeah. So you take your solid from the first solution. Okay. You could. I okay. I want it's you to. Too. Your strategy is okay, but you need to change something. Oh, oh, sorry. Yeah, you, you'll put it in another solution that can only dissolve C, but not B or A. And then you take your solid out of that. And then you like. So what is what precipitated? You are going to dissolve it again. Yes. So then your solid after that second and one. And pay attention. Your salt is the salt concentration when you do that. It's really hard to, what would you add? What would you add to make them salt bloods once they precipitate? I'm gonna back off on this question. I have a strong sense that my answer is no. Your answer can get close to the correct answer. I'm trying to lead you. Okay. What about this? First, we don't care about numbers. It's a descriptive answer, okay? We don't care about. It. Imagine we don't. <clears throat> The salt concentration at which A and B are solubilized. So imagine it is 0.3. I don't want to talk with num based on numbers, but if I add that salt concentration that precipitates these two, but not the rest, then I separate A and B. And what I have still soluble are C, D, and E, okay? And from there, so now I have a solution that has C, D, and E. Now I can add salt concentration that precipitates C. So from lower to higher. First, separate these two. They precipitate at salt concentration, which is lower than what C needs, then separate C. B and E are still solubilized. We don't care about it. We want to separate C. So if I, if I wanted to go with your strategy, yeah. yeah, add water to make C. Once you separate A and B, you started with high salt concentration. Yes. So these are precipitated. A and C would be precipitated. Okay. And then you still have you, you still have high salt concentration once they precipitate. Okay. Then if you add water in a way that just C gets solubilized. Still, you have high salt concentration. My approach is the easiest way, but your approach, I can say it's not correct. It's hard to do. But still, if, if you could add that second part, your response was, so you were close. Are we good? The other approach that we can use to separate proteins based on their solubility is the isoelectric point. You know the isoelectric point. The pH or the point, the pH that the net charge of protein is zero. 
It doesn't mean protein doesn't have any charge. The net charge, sum of negative and positive charges are, is zero. So the net charge is zero. So for example, if we want to separate the PI for case is 4.6. If you want to separate casein from whey protein iso, whey proteins, what would you do? PI of whey proteins are higher than 4.6. I think it's about 5.5 or something. So what can we do? Decrease the pH to 4.6 so that the net charge of casein is zero, and then protein-protein interaction, the hydrophobic bonds happen, and we have aggregation and precipitation of casein. So one traditional method to prepare cheese is acidic cheese, and we use this. We use changes in pH and in decreasing the pH to isoelectric point of casein. We can produce cheese either by enzyme or acid. The principles behind acid uh, method is that we precipitate casein at its isoelectric point. The other method that we can use to separate proteins based on their solubility is solvent fractionation. So here we need to use those solvents that can denature protein, like alcohols, like acetone. These are examples. So what do they do? When you add acid, to a protein or protein solution that cause protein unfolding. For globulin proteins, their interior part is more hydrophobic compared to their surface. So once they unfold, the hydrophobic residues are more exposed. So again, hydrophobic residues or amino acids can interact with each other and cause aggregation and if we add acetone at appropriate concentration. So it differs from sample to sample. We, this, these are just the, the mechanism. The acetone concentration we need for one sample differs from the other. You know, one protein differs uh, from the other type of protein. But the mechanism is the same. They unfold the protein and increase the hydrophobic residues on the surface and cause protein-protein interaction, followed by aggregation and precipitation. So we can separate the precipitated protein. Again, based on solubility. Another method that we can use is the naturation of protein. We can use different parameters to denature protein, pH, heat, ionic strength, different things. The most common one or the most usual one that is really, really easy to think about it is heat. Once you heat a protein, it unfolds, it denatures. Again, the same phenomenon. Once protein unfolds and denatures, they can interact with each other. And again, aggregation and precipitation. It depends on the, the naturation temperature. Proteins are different in their denaturation the temperature, what we talked before. They are different in their thermal stability. So for example, for Whey proteins, any temperature higher than, I don't know, um, 70 or 75 would be okay. But for casein, it's really, really stable. You need to apply high temperature, 
more than 130 degrees Celsius, more than 140 degrees Celsius. So they differ, but this is the, the mechanism. Once you denature them, you make sure the temperature is above their denaturation temperature. You can heat them for specific period, like half an hour, one hour, two hours, and you can aggregate them and precipitate them. One example of a uh, protein separation based on solubility that is common in food industry to produce protein ingredients. For example, soy protein. Soy protein flour, soy protein concentrate, soy protein flakes, soy protein flakes, soy protein isolates are different soy protein ingredients that we have in industry and they produce. So imagine you want to uh, produce soy protein concentrates and soy protein isolates. What is the difference between concentrate and ice? The, the purity. Yeah. Yes. Correct. Isolate is like ninety nine. Trade like ninety five. Ninety nine is hot. It's really hot. Anything above nine or eighty five percent, we call it isolate. Um, in most texts, you can see ninety percent, but in reality, even lower is considered as protein ice. But with protein concentrate, um. 60 to 70 percent that addresses protein concentrate. So to produce protein concentrate in so first step is to extract the fat because soy is a is an oil seed. So the first step is to separate the fat, do defatting. Once you do defatting, then you can use alcohol or just water washing to eliminate different compounds which are soluble in alcohol or soluble in water. And once you dry it, you have soy protein concentrate with more than 60% protein concentration. And then if you do extrusion, you have textured soy uh, protein concentrate. So the main concept is that you have just one step of washing on your defected sample, followed by dry. For that washing step, you can use water or alcohol. But to produce protein isolate, soy protein isolate, which needs uh, more purity, higher purity, we need to solubilize the protein we need to increase its solubility. So when you have defected soy flour, you need to solubilize it in alkaline water, increase its solubility. Once you increase the solubility of the protein in alkaline solution at pH 7.5, 8, 8.5 or 9, then, you can separate the protein at its isolated point. So you add HCl and acidify that and decrease the pH to 4, 4.5, which is the isolated point of soy. And you, the protein precipitates. And then if you do some you know, centrifugation step, you can separate that precipitated protein. And now you can neutralize the protein at pH 7 to make it soluble and then do spray drying in industry, spray drying in research work, you can do this drying. And now you have soy protein isolate with like 90% protein concentration. So first, the difference is in their uh, purity. Why? Because the procedure we are using is different. With protein concentrate, we just do a one step washing on the defected flower. With protein isolate, we do alkaline solubilization, 
or salt in soy, alkaline solubilization is the most common way. And then precipitate the protein. So more work. Another method of here. This slide is really important. Stay. Okay. This is based on uh, ion exchange chromatography. And the principle is adsorption. So no more solubility. It's based on adsorption of protein to a surface. So with ion exchange chromatography, we have a polymer, we have a surface, and then we have our protein and buff. So we have three main elements. The polymer, polymer, protein, and then your buff. You know, with ion exchange chromatography, we have cation exchange chromatography and anion exchange chromatography. So the main principle is that it's based on adsorption, so surface phenomenon. The eluting buffer which uh, goes through your column, and then you have some proofs on your column. That can be deeper. And then you we'll have your protein that carries the same charge as your eluting buffer. Okay, so the charge of your protein and eluting buffer should be the same for the process. Usually, that column is polysaccharide based, okay? What we do is that based on the polymer, the ion exchange chromatography, if it is a weak acid that can have a negative charge, then you have ion exchange. Why? Because the weak acid can release its H group. If it is a weak base, like diethyl amidethyl, then you have a positive charge here, and it is an ion How? We go with an ion exchange, then we go with the ion exchange. With an ion exchange, you have a positive group here. What happened? The negative group was released in your eluting buffer. Buffer has negative charge. Phosphate buffer as, at pH seven. And then you have your protein. Protein should have the same charge as your buffer, minus. So protein can interact with the groups of your column, an interaction, adsorption, a surface phenomenon, okay? The most important point is that to do ion exchange chromatography, you need to avoid isoelectric point. Why? Because the net charge of protein is zero and protein can precipitate. And if it precipitates, your column is gone. You don't have column. You, you want to avoid isoelectric. So if you are going to use an ion exchange chromatography, you should use uh, a buffer that has a pH higher than the isoelectric point of your protein. Let's say the isoelectric point of your protein is like 4 then your buffer should have any pH higher than 4.5 or 5. 4.5 is risky. 
So five, six, seven, higher than isoelectric one, to carry negative charge and to charge your protein negative. So your buffer has negative charge, your protein has negative charge. So the negative charge is kind of transferred between the column and the protein. So the column should have positive charge so that your protein can interact with column, absorb on column, and you can have that separation. If you want to use, uh, so this is an ion. If you want to use cation exchange chromatography, and for anion exchange chromatography, one of the most common uh, polymers or columns are diethyl amine ethyl, which is a weak base. If you want to use a uh, cation exchange chromatography, then everything is completely vice versa. Your protein has positive charge, the buffer has positive charge, and your column is negatively charged. So you learn one of them, and for the other one, just go the opposite. Does it make sense? Is it clear? So you can't do like static separation with ion exchange because you would just end up having proteins stuck to your column. Like you it doesn't stop. It yeah. doesn't stop. Then for the next step, after after you have your so once you use this buffer and you make sure protein is interacted, mm -hmm. then you need to add another buffer. And you make sure all the like, one example, you want to separate protein from sugars, okay? You use an ion exchange chromatography and you make sure protein is absorbed on the column and the sugars come out in wash, okay? Then you add another uh, eluting buffer to get the protein out of the column and you can collect the protein. So it's based on electrostatic interaction. Protein doesn't stop. It, it's not, uh, the reason I told you you need to avoid isoelectric point is that we don't want yeah. the protein stuck. Yeah. So proteins, uh, let's say you have a protein that its isoelectric point is 6.2. Then if you work, your buffer has a pH of 5, your protein is positively charged. You just need to avoid isoelectric. You don't want to, if your protein has like pH seven, you don't want to decrease the pH to five to make it positive. No, go about it. And then work with ion exchange chromatography based on that. Just avoid that isoelectric one. And don't change the pH once your protein is solubilized, you cannot change the pH. If you think you are going to pass the isolate by changing the, bu uh, the buffer, no, it's not a choice. Mm -hmm. I think Stella would ask more. So that means that the pH of the buffer will be the So it's opposite. The protein should be positively charged. Does it make sense? So,
Yes. A question for you. Have a piece of paper and think about it. Most of the proteins in a mixture have PIs about 6 to 6.5. But the protein that you want to separate from the rest is believed to have a PI of about 4.5. You want to separate this protein from the others by ion exchange chromatography. Would you use an anion exchange or cation exchange resin? And what pH would you use for your buffer? Which proteins will elute in the wash and why? Have a piece of paper and think about it. You have like five minutes, not more. I need to talk about hydrophobia. Less than five minutes. So close to what we talked about. You wanna wait I said like point on the side. At the same time you wanna this specific protein interacts with the column, the rest don't interact. Just play with the isoelectric point. You just need to pay attention to that. Okay. You have different proteins at pH six to six point five. The isoelectric point of your desired protein is four point five. There is a gap here. About that gap, let's call it the is about two. And pH 4.5 to 6 or 6.5. Let's say 1.5. So I want to avoid isoelectric point of all of them. All of them. My desired protein or the rest. What would you suggest? This, I wrote it. <laughs> Any pH higher than 4.5, lower than 6. Why? All of them are solubilized. None of them stick to the column. So if I work at pH 5 or 5.5, because I can't work at pH 6, I can't work at pH 4.5, okay? Any pH about 5, or 5.5 is higher than the isoelectric point of my desired protein. At any pH higher than the isoelectric point of your protein, your protein is negatively charged, okay? So now my desired protein at this pH 
is negatively charged. The other proteins, because pH 5 or 5.5 is lower than the isoelectric point, they will be positively charged. Oh, sorry. So you have two groups. My desired protein is negatively charged at this pH. The rest are positively charged. Is it clear for you that because it's higher, the pH we are working is higher than the isoelectric point of the desired protein and lower than the isoelectric point of the rest of the proteins. So now that my protein is negatively charged, it's easy to work with a buffer, which has negative charge, and so work with an ion exchange chromatography that has positive groups, positive derivatized group or positive sites. So my protein, which is negatively charged, can interact, but the rest of the proteins have positive charge. So they go out, they have no interaction, positive and positive. They repel each other, they, they don't interact, they don't absorb each other. They, there is no interaction with them, them, just repulsive forces. So the rest of the proteins go out in the wash with buffer. My desired protein can interact with color. Now, The second part of the question, how will you elute the proteins, the desired protein that interacted with colon? How would you elute the proteins that bind to the colon? After that interaction, you want the protein, the desired protein to come out, collect it, separate it. You did this as a method of separation. So you want your protein, you want your desired protein. All other components were washed out, and now you have your protein interacted with colon. Now, you, now that you are sure the only thing you have in colon is your desired protein, you need to help it to get out. What would you do? You need to change the elution buffer. What would you do? Essentially, add salt, but like positive ion, the one in the pH. Positive so ions. So if you add positive ion, again, it gets to PI. You need a stronger buffer. A stronger buffer in terms of interaction with colon so that it can replace the protein. You need to use a buffer with more negative charge a more alkaline buffer. So it has more negative charge compared with protein, so it can replace the protein. The buffer with more negative charge, let's say this is buffer, comes here and then the protein gets released and get out and come. So if you're, because when you're, you're six, six, five, proteins are eluded and they're mm -hmm. out. Can you just move that direction then with your pH? So you're at five. Could you, once they're gone, mm -hmm. could you safely go to like six and seven? Exactly. We are making it exactly, exactly. Once we are sure that the other compounds, other components are out, are in wash, and we don't have them in our buffer, in our system, now we can change the elution buffer and use an elution buffer that has uh, stronger interactions with the column compared to the protein. So the first step is always separate the protein. Separate your desired compound, then elute it. And with proteins, you need to avoid isoelectric. So it's not always there is one correct and a specific uh, approach. Whatever your approach is, 
is has to be has to avoid isoelectric point, eludes other compounds, results in protein interaction with colon, and then eludes the protein. So just you need to play with this. One or two more minutes. <laughs> the last uh I think the last, not the last adsorption, but I want to talk about this. Hydrophobic interaction chromatography or HIC, you can see this. Hydrophobic interaction chromatography is another method based on adsorption. So it's a surface phenomenon. Again, uh, here, you have hydro and you have your protein, which is solubilized in water. So you need what? You need hydrophobic interactions between protein and color. Why? Because the derived, not derived, the active site of your column are hydrophobic. So the only interaction they can have to retain your protein is hydrophobic interaction. So you need to do salting out. You need to use a mechanism that results in salting out of your outcomes. How? High salt concentration. Two molar aluminum sulfate is the most common salt that we use for salting out of protein as, a, as an approach for protein precipitation, for, for protein aggregation. So once you do that, protein, as a result of salting out, proteins aggregate and can interact outside of colon via hydrophobic interactions, and you can separate your protein. And the last one is based on affinity chromatography. Again, it's based on absorption. Which are specific for your protein, like antibody antigen. And your specific protein, because of the shape, because of the, you know, it, it, it has a different shape, they cannot. They cannot interact. So with affinity chromatography, it's again an absorption phenomenon, but based on the match between specific protein and a specific side. This is the last slide for today. And thank you. If you have any question, I can stay longer and answer your questions. Thank you, much. Mm -hmm. um, and Pat, she would take like the, the answer she No, she yeah. didn't ask me. Yeah. Okay. There's ten calls. But do you? Like, but like, but like, if you don't make a funny little last thing that you would request, just sort of. Yeah, but usually, like, sometimes Pat will say, like, you can turn it on for after. I stopped sharing, but not with you.